Hey everyone. Uh, we're just going to give it a minute or two. We have a, a bunch of folks signed up, so they should be rhyming, but uh, we'll get started in about a minute. Great to have everybody here. <clears throat> I'm assuming you can see my shared screen. And uh, if not, somebody let me know. But you should be seeing a screen that says systems thinking for newcomers. And it's, uh, if you have the bandwidth, it's great to see your faces. Uh, <clears throat> it's always nice to see people, but uh, you don't have to, obviously. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, there'll probably be quite a number of people coming and joining as we get started. But uh, thanks for thanks for being here today. And we will record this and uh, post it later. Um, it's, it's great to see so many signups and attendees who are, are new to systems thinking. Um, this event actually started as, as a result of a post on systems thinking daily by Deidre Clark, where she said, uh, I think her post was anyone here that's new to systems thinking, I'd love to find a learning partner. So um, I want to encourage you to look around and there are many learning partners to choose from. Feel free to message each other or whatever. It's a, it's a great way to, to dive into something together. And um, as you'll see, Laura and I uh, are committed and our lab is committed, especially not just to doing basic research and innovation and systems thinking, but um, we're especially committed to making it accessible and also high fidelity for newcomers. So this is really one of the things that we focus on a lot is, is making it um, accessible to newcomers and making systems thinking quickly assimilatable and understandable and, and making it so people can get value out of it right away. So today I was going to just give a, a short talk, um, a summary of some of the things I share with our graduate students at Cornell with first grade through 12th grade teachers, with CEOs and business leaders around the world, with leaders in private and public sectors, with parents, uh, with five-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 95-year-olds. Uh, anyone can learn systems thinking and anyone um, can, can use systems thinking. So please feel free to interrupt me at any time. This is really a, an informal thing. Um, and ask a question or, or make a statement, or you, if you don't want to do that, you can write it in text and I'll try to remember to look over at the text and answer. Um, and after the summary, we'll do a cool activity that will hopefully help you to practice systems thinking uh, and see the benefits of it right away. So with that, um, we are ready to dive in and we'll start with just a quick, uh, introduction to our lab, a little background. Our, our lab, uh, Laura and I lead our, our research lab, and we focus on three areas, basic research, like I said, in cognition and uh, complexity. Um, we also focus a lot on innovating things like tools. So we've developed software, we've developed blocks, we've developed lots of different tools, and we research those tools because obviously doing system well, systems thinking well just like a carpenter or any other person, tools are, are super helpful. So we actually develop uh, and innovate new tools. And then our third kind of main focus is actually public understanding, which is you know, what we're doing here is, is making sure that, that people understand the science, that the science is accessible, um, that, it, that you can use it with high fidelity and all that kind of stuff. So we're really interested in those kinds of things. And we have four focus areas, systems thinking, systems mapping, which is visualizing it, um, systems leadership, which is how it plays out in organizations and leadership and stuff like that, and system science, which is, um, you know, kind of the, uh, the, how it plays out in nature, in the real world. So uh, today we're mostly going to talk about systems thinking, and um, <clears throat> we'll dive into that. And we're going to try to answer four fundamental questions. Why, why do we do systems thinking in the first place? What is it? That's the one that most people want to know. 
uh, how do you do it? You know, how do you actually practice it? And how do you apply systems thinking to your, to your life or your work, uh, that type of thing. So we're gonna hit on hopefully all four of those things. Um, prior to, to becoming, uh, uh, oh, there's Deirdre. Thank, it's great to see you, Deirdre. Deirdre is the reason this whole thing happened. So uh, I'm glad that you posted that and, and I'm glad that you're, you're sort of hosting this in a way. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, prior to, yeah, sorry. Do you wanna say anything? Nope, I'm just happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> um, prior to becoming a cognitive scientist and a systems theorist, I, I was actually something completely different in another past life. I was a mountain guide. It was kind of the skill that I had out of high school and I did that for 20 years. I took people up and down mountains all over the world and climbed a lot of the high altitude mountains in the world. And I learned, I, I tell you that because I learned most of what I know about systems, being in the mountains, being in a tent, 250 days, 230 days a year, um, uh, being on the tent in the side of the mountain and, and watching the climatological systems, the geological systems, the physics, the chemistry of the body, the, the physics and, and mountain rescue systems and all those kinds of, all the systems that happen as a result of mountaineering. And the mountains are a great metaphor for life. Um, in the mountains, things are, are VUCA. They're, they're volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And um, VUCA is a term that was actually coined by the military, but today it's used in the private sector in lots of different places. And I don't need to tell you much about VUCA because you live in a VUCA world every day. Your jobs are VUCA, your organizations are VUCA. You know, you're, if you have kids and dogs, your families are, are, are VUCA. Uh, and um, that's, that's you know, COVID is VUCA, all of it's VUCA. So um, you guys know VUCA like uh, you're, you're experts in VUCA. Um, but the real world is VUCA. Real world six systems are one, probably the best way we can gen generally describe them is that they're VUCA. They're volatile, they're uncertain, they're complex, and they're often ambiguous. Um, and that's not really the problem. That's just the reality that we have to deal with. Um, so that's, that's the world. The problem is that, and this is kind of a technical term, our, our thinking tends to be, and for 2,500 years has been, what I like to call LAMO. And LAMO is linear, anthropocentric, which means kind of human-centered. We, we sort of imagine the world being centered around us, mechanistic, and ordered. And the mismatch between those two things is really the problem. So systems thinking is trying to solve that. That's kind of the why of systems thinking. So let me just give you a few examples. The, the real world is dynamic, it's adaptive, it's organic, and it's constantly evolving. Yet we tend to think very mechanistically. We tend to think almost like everything's a machine and it's very simple and stuff like that. We use even metaphors like the universe is like a clock or the brain is like a computer, which are not true. The universe is nothing like a clock and the brain is really nothing like a computer. A bra the brain is kind of a mushy, very dynamical thing. A computer is you know, very different, right? If you look at a computer and a brain. So uh, the real world is multivalent by nature. Now that's just a big word that means it can be and both right? It, 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 and both can be true rather than either or. Our thinking tends to be kind of needlessly bivalent, which means either or. And let me just give you an example of what I mean by this, a real world example. Do your customers want your product to be faster or cheaper? That's Yes, <laughs> exactly. Right. They want both. So we live in a world where it's not either or it's and both. And uh, a lot of things are and both. Right. Uh, there's good and bad and there's bad and good. And, you know, the worst things that have happened to your life are sometimes some of the best things and the best things sometimes turn out to be some of the worst things and all kinds of things. So uh, the world is sort of like that. The real world is networked and nested and complex with, it even has a, a sprinkling of randomness in it. 
which makes things very, very difficult to track. Um, yet we tend to think of things in ordered and static categories and hierarchies, right? Um, so that, that doesn't really work out very well. There's a big mismatch there. And the real world is linear, nonlinear. It includes lots of feedback cycles. It includes webs of causality rather than, you know, in the real world, there's no single cause. There's webs of causality. But we tend to think, you know, X causes Y, and that's it. That's kind of just a basic causality. But in the real world, it, you know, 28 different things cause something that happened. Yet we, we tend to think in these very linear causal ways. And finally, the, the real world is agnostic about humans. It really, in the whole scheme of things, doesn't care. We think COVID's trying to kill us. COVID's not trying to kill us. It's just doing its thing. Uh, we, we think that, you know, we're the center of the universe. We literally, in the beginning, thought we were the center of the universe. Then we, you know, figured out the sun was the center. And then we figured out, boy, the universe is a lot bigger than our galaxy. And our galaxy isn't even in the center. Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And we go through the day, our day, thinking most of the time that we're kind of at the center. Um, but the real world doesn't really uh, think that way. It doesn't really uh, operate that way. And um, so that gets in our way. That causes a lot of bias. So systems thinking is really about how the real world is and how we think about it. And hopefully, the way we think about it kind of aligns better, not perfectly, but better with the way the real world is. So if we can get rid of this lame thinking and replace it with something, that's systems thinking. And what we're going to show you today is a thing called DSRP, which is the, they're kind of the universal patterns that underlie what we mean when we talk about systems thinking. And basically, it's that we, we, um, our mental models are constantly adapting and evolving, and um, we make distinctions. We make systems, part whole organizing systems. Uh, we make relationships, and we take perspectives, and that's it. It's it's very simple, but it but we can mix and match those things in very 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 complex ways to do very complex things. So if you if you actually look at the words systems thinking, the secret to systems thinking is in the title, believe it or not. And that is that the systems part of systems thinking is referring to all those VUCA systems in the real world. And the thinking part of systems thinking is referring to all the mental models that you create about those systems. And those systems could be anything. They could be you know, your job, your product, your, you know, your, your practice, what you're trying to get done in the world, your family, you know, how to make something better, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't really matter what part of the world you're looking at. So that gets us to one of the most fundamental, most important things in systems thinking. It's kind of the, the core of what systems thinking is, and we call it the systems thinking loop. And all it is is that our mental models are interacting with the real world, and then the real world is doing something with our mental models. And um, so let, let's first dive into what, what a mental model is, because mental models are at the crux. They're kind of the crux of systems thinking. So I want to show you this quick video that I think is one of the best videos for understanding mental models, because a lot of people think mental models is like framework, but actually mental models are happening all the time. So you're going to see that right here in this video. So that's a, that's a great example of, uh, of systems thinking and mental models, right? And, and what you can see is that it's happening all the time. 
Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. And reality is just being reality, right? The alligator was never a log. The alligator was always an alligator, but we had different mental models of what it was. And then there's even at the end, there's this possibility of learning occurring. And this new guy comes on the scene and he thinks the same thing. And then presumably you have another uh, disagreement and it keeps going on and on. <laughs> um, but this really gets us to the crux of systems thinking, which is that th this quote that, that uh, kind of captures what systems thinking is all about and why we do it, uh, which is that wicked problems are the problems that we have result from the mismatch, the mismatch between how the real world systems work and how we think they work. So if we can change our thinking to be more in alignment with how real world systems work, then when we do things, when we execute certain plans, those plans will have a higher probability of working. Um, so let me give you a, a little more examples of what we mean by mental models and, and having them work or not work or be in alignment. This is a, a great mental model of how we think uh, an organizational system works, right? It's called an org chart. You know, we say, this is how our organization works. There's somebody at the top and then they report to those people those people report to them and then down, down we go. And, um, and it's really a great thing. And it, it's, it's very popular. Every organization has one because it's really simple. It's easy to understand and, uh, and that kind of thing. But the truth is that the organization doesn't work at all like that. The organization works probably more something like this, which is that there's a lot of nonlinear relationships going on, non-hierarchical. Uh, while there is some formal reporting structure, there's also a lot of informal relationships. Uh, influence is not always situated in the hierarchy. Influence could be caused by nonlinear or asymmetrical relationships or, you know, those kinds of things. So it's a lot, lot more complex and a lot more dynamic than, the, than our first mental model was. And if we treat our organization like that first mental model, then when we press the buttons that we think we should press, we're not going to get the results we think we should get. So that means that our mental models, that all of our mental models that we're having all the time about something are always, always just approximations of the real world, of real world systems. What that means is that our mental models are actually always wrong to some degree. And in fact, the great statistician George Box said, all mental models are wrong, but some are useful, right? So all of our mental models are wrong, but some are less wrong than others and some are very useful. And the goal of having a mental model is to have it be a good approximation of the system that you're looking at. Now. The way you do that is you test your mental model in the real world. And importantly, you get feedback from the real world. And that feedback comes in the form of information. So information goes back into our mental models, right? If we don't do that, then our mental models sort of stay static and they don't evolve, they don't change, and they don't get incrementally better, right? So we want to incorporate that feedback and we want to constantly be testing our mental models against the real world. Now, I want to tell you something about um, a, a bias because uh, there's we have lots of biases. In fact, I would say if we were to take the last 50 or 60 years of, of the cognitive sciences and summarize what we've learned from them, right? I would say that we knew that humans were biased. But what we've learned is that they're even more biased than we thought they were. <laughs> and by humans, I mean all of us, right? So what cognitive science has really taught us in the last 50 years is that we're actually way, way more biased than we thought we were, and we thought we were pretty biased. Yeah? And so I wanna tell you about some of the biggest biases there is. This one I call reality bias. It's kind of the grandfather or grandmother of all biases. And it's the belief that we see the world directly as it is, like on the left, right? We see the world directly as it is with no awareness of the veil that we're shrouded in. And that veil 
is our mental models. And we're always looking through that veil. The truth is we see the world indirectly mediated through our mental models. That is mind blowing if you think about it. We don't experience the world directly, we experience the world indirectly through our mental models. So the thing that we have to really work with, the thing that we have to work with, not, not only have to work with, but must work with, need to work with, um, is our mental models. Now I wanna show you this, this is one of my favorite uh, uh, cartoons, right? It says, say, what's that mountain goat doing up here in the cloud bank? Right? What, what we have to understand is that this is a, a great cartoon that captures another bias called confirmation bias. One of the most pervasive biases that we face is confirmation bias. And that causes us to filter real world information and fit it to our mental model rather than to fit our mental model to the real world. I want you to say that over again in your mind. Confirmation bias is just getting the loop going in the other direction. So we fit the real world to our mental model rather than fitting our mental model to the real world. That's critically important. So if you, you could have your mental model in your real world and get the loop going the wrong way and you've got a whole lot of confirmation bias or you can get it going the right way and you've got a whole lot of learning. Very, very important confirmation bias. So that leads us to sort of complete the model, which is that we're constantly approximating by testing. We're constantly getting incorporating feedback in the form of information. And we iterate going round and round. And we make sure that we're going in the right direction. So iterate, approximation, information, iteration of mental models and the real world. And this is the crux of systems thinking. It's the crux of systems thinking. It's also the crux of human learning, science as an endeavor. Uh, you, you, you could change the terms a little bit and you'd get evolution as a theory. Uh, there's lots of things going on here. Design thinking is based on this loop. All the different big, big human sort of iterative uh, things are based on this loop. So it's a pretty important idea. Okay, so we incorporate, uh, we. I want to hit on another idea that's very, very popular in systems thinking. And, you know, maybe you've seen it before, but we'll go through it. And that is that we call it the iceberg. And that is that let's pretend you're the boat or maybe your organization is the boat. And hopefully the boat isn't the Titanic, right? But um, the systems thinking iceberg gives us insight into why we should focus on mental models. So you may have seen this idea and the top of the iceberg, what's seen by the boat is what we call events. So that's like, you know, the information, the, the ideas, the content, the details of what happened, right? But what we know in systems thinking, what systems thinking tries to get us to do is look a little beneath the surface and see the unseen. And if we look beneath the surface, we see there's a lot more beneath the surface. So we see more. And one of the first things we wanna see is what's called patterns, right? And the reason we wanna see patterns is because patterns allow us to predict, right? And a pattern is just an event that's repeated, something repeated. So two is the smallest pattern. And then three and four just reinforces those patterns. And it gives us precious seconds or minutes or days or weeks or months or years to predict and, and be able to, to know that something's coming. But there's something a little deeper that we want to look for in systems thinking, and that is what's called system structures. Now, structures are really important, and, and this is something that I, I, I sometimes joke with my grad students that they should get tattooed on their arm. It's so important. But my wife says I shouldn't advocate that young people tattoo themselves. But, um, and it says uh, system structure determines behavior. Now, think about that for a second. What does that mean? It means that the structure of a system determines the system's behavior. What does that mean to you? That means that if you don't like the way a system's behaving, and a system could be your department, your company, your family, yourself, your body, whatever, 
If you don't like the way it's behaving, the, the reason it's behaving that way is the system structure. And if you do like the way it's behaving, the reason it's behaving that way is the system structure. So you should really pay attention to system structure because that allows you to design. Because when you know the system structure and you know the behavior, then you can sort of tweak the system structure and get different behavior. But there's one more thing that really systems thinking encourages us to go deeper and see, and that is mental models. And that's what we just talked about is this, this ST loop, the systems thinking loop, and seeing your mental models. And believe it or not, a lot of people have that reality bias. They go through life and they don't even think about mental models. They think they're experiencing the world directly. But just the first step in systems thinker for newcomers is understand that there's a mental model between you and the real, real world. And then we start to ask questions about our mental models and how to get them to be better. So we've gone over the first big step in systems thinking, and that is this ST loop, right? Mental models, approximate, test them against the real world, get informational feedback, and then incorporate it, and then make your mental model a little better, test it again, therefore iteration. That's the first step in systems thinking. You'd, you'd be surprised how few people and few organizations actually do this, right? You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised how few people take their model, test it, and then get results, and then change their model a little bit, and then test it again, and get results, and then change their model, fundamentally learning. You'd be surprised. There's a lot of people that have the same experience over and over and over again and never change their behavior, which means they're not doing this. So this might seem like really basic and simple, but it's really not practiced very often. The second thing we got to do is understand that mental models are actually made up of two things. The first thing they're made up of is obvious information. Now, where's the information coming from? hopefully the real world, right? If you're going the right direction, the information's coming from the real world, real world systems. So we know that mental models have information in it, but they also have something else that give them meaning. And that is how we structure that information because that information in and of itself doesn't have meaning. The way we structure it gives it meaning. And this is where it's really critical to understand systems thinking. So. That, that structure is called thinking. Uh, other words for it are cognition. That's kind of the academic or scientific term for thinking. Uh, we, can, we sometimes call it structure. We sometimes call it encoding. And sometimes we just call it organizing, the organizing of information or encoding of information or structuring of information or thinking of information. It's all the same thing, just different words for the same thing. Now, what I'm gonna show you today is the research on what constitutes that thinking that makes it systemic. And it turns out that there are four universal patterns to that thinking. And those that we, we just call them DSRP because that's the name of the four patterns. We make distinctions, we organize systems of part whole, we, we make relationships between things and we take perspectives. And when we take perspectives, the, the distinctions can change and the way it's organized can change and the, the, what's related can change. So you can see it already starts to, you can start to mix and match them to get very, very complex. And on the other side is all forms of information, content, data that comes in, right? And you structure it into a meaningful mental model and then you test that mental model. So it's kind of a one, two, three, um, approach. And so at its base, systems thinking is made up of all these rules, distinction making, made up of identity and other. You don't have to understand those right now as newcomers, but later you'll, you'll get to understand that the elements are really important. Systems are made up of parts and holes. Relationships are made up of action and reaction, kind of like Newton's law. Uh, perspective is made up of point and view, right? And a simple way of saying this, again, just when you're new to this, it gets much, much more complex and much more robust and, com and technical. 
But you can just ask these four simple questions. What distinctions am I making? What are the salient parts of the system? Are there relationships among the parts? And what different perspectives could I take to better understand the issue? So at the most basic level, you can just ask yourself those four questions and that'll get you started, right? There's lots more to learn around what these four patterns do for you, but to just get started out of the gates, just ask those four questions and that'll get you started, right? So I wanna give you a kind of an example uh, that, that's on everybody's mind, uh, right? And that is COVID. And let's take this example of COVID and let's look at it. Um, COVID-19 is, is definitely VUCA, right? That's the reality of COVID. It's volatile, it's uncertain, it's constantly changing and the information that we get about it is constantly changing. It's complex. There's many, many webs of causality and micro behavior and delay and macro results. And it's hard to see how the micro behavior is connected to the macro results sometimes because there's delay between them. And of course it's ambiguous, right? There's multiple stakeholders with conflicting interests and uh, it makes COVID a real, a real wicked problem. Now we could take a ton of different perspectives on COVID, right? There's a scientific perspective, there's a political, economic, social, social perspective. We could take the perspective of regional bubbles. We could take a mental health perspective. We could even take an anti-masker, anti-vaxxer perspective. Um, and that might sound like not something you wanna do, but you do because that perspective is changing their behavior. And their behavior is causing real things to occur in the system that you care about. So even if you disagree with a perspective, you still have to understand it because that perspective is influencing the behavior of possibly tens of thousands or millions. And then you get system wide effects. Uh, maybe millennials and students are have a very different perspective than others schools, hoaxers, CDC, who, and then the various countries. And of course, there are many, many more perspectives that you could take uh, that would look at the COVID pandemic differently and see different things. Let's look at the distinctions, right? Just the distinctions we make, right? We can't barely even name the thing. There's so many different names for it, right? I mean, some of them incredibly offensive, some of them not, some, you know, uh, we can't even really get at the cause of things because there's, it's a web of causality, right? We, we are not even sure what the origins are. The, uh, the symptoms, remember the symptoms in the beginning? And then later we learned uh, sometimes there's those symptoms and sometimes not. So we're, we're changing the distinctions as we go. The treatments are changing constantly and we're getting better and better, hopefully. The terms, there's lots of new terms and those terms mean specific things. And if we don't understand the meanings, then we can be uh, confused by, by, by the system. And of course, there's many strategies and things like that that have names too. What does flatten the curve mean? There's been even something as simple as flatten the curve. We have different meanings. Different people think of that as a different distinction. So your distinction and my distinction might use the same word, but mean completely different things or we might use different words and mean the same thing, right? And that's just a, that's just a, fa a function of distinction making. And of course there's systems of all kinds. There's knowledge, stakeholder system constraints, system structures, strategies, all those kinds of things. You can imagine lots of different systems that would have to be analyzed. And of course there's relationships. Every X, Y graph that you see on the news is actually a relationship between the stuff on the x-axis relating to the stuff on the y-axis and the tests, the cases, all these different things, right? It's 5G related to COVID or not, so uh, et cetera. It's not, by the way. Uh, linear causality and webs of causality, all relational. So success and failure both utilize the ST loop, but in different ways. And I wanna show you two different ways. 
So let's look at the Bob archetype on the left. The Bob archetype believes certain specific things, right? Their mental model is made up of the virus is a hoax, no mass. It's okay to socialize. We need to open businesses and schools and we can cherry pick whatever data we want. And we're gonna fit reality to our mental model. So we're gonna go that direction, right? And the Sioux archetype is the virus is serious, wear a mask, stay six feet, wash hands, quarantine, test, trace, flatten, and exalt the data. And so that one's going the other way, fit the mental model to reality. Now I wanna ask you in these two archetypes, what happens, what happens if they're all Bobs? What happens if they're all Sues? And what happens if they're a mix of Bobs and Sues, right? That's obviously gonna make your system really, really different. If there are all Bobs, all Sues are all a mix. But whatever happens on the left is all those mental models of Bob Sues or mixed Bobs and Sues are gonna manifest in behavior. That behavior is gonna have collective dynamics and then we're gonna have results, real systems, real world results of the system. Like how many people die? How many people get infected? How much the hospitals are overwhelmed? How many people get vaccinated? All that kind of stuff. So this is a great example of the, 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 the distinctions that individuals are making, the, the way that they're seeing it, their perspective, the parts of the whole that they're seeing, the relationships that they're seeing or not seeing. And then you multiply that times all the Bobs and all the Sues and all the Bobs and Sues, and you get the emergent properties of this COVID situation. Oh, there's a question. Hold on a second. Evan said, can you help discern between distinction and definition or why you chose? To, yeah, that's great. So definition is really, um, you know, definitions like what you find in the dictionary, right? Like, so the word car has a definition. Distinction is really about two elements, identity and other. So it's, what is the identity of the thing? And by virtue of doing that, you create an other. So let me give you an example. If you have an organization that has a, a distinction, an identity called human resources, a department, then, then that's a distinction. And you can say what that distinction means, what an HR department does and all that kind of stuff. But it also is embedded in that distinction. The identity of that is that somehow your goal, your job is to manage resources which are human, right? But there's an other, there's an alternative distinction that could be made different than the one you're making, which is maybe humans aren't really resources. That would be a completely different identity that HR would be the other two. So when we start to think about the identities we're making and we consider the opportunity cost of that distinction identity that we're making is the other that we're not making, we start to realize that there's opportunity costs in the distinctions we make. And so we want to make sure that we make the right distinctions that don't have bias in them or that have the, the bias that you're willing to accept in them. Does that answer that question? So definition is a lot less complex, a lot less... Um, it's, it, you know, a definition is kind of like, you know, if you read something in the dictionary, that's the definition, but that's not the, uh, that's not the meaning of, of, of a word uh, when it plays out in context or when it plays out in, in mental models. And then uh, somebody else said, collective dynamics that can be qualified, quantified as net positive or net neg or negative. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Which is a perspective, right? <laughs> so it's happening at all levels. Okay. So what I want to do now, and, and, and unless you have more questions and we'll have time to answer questions at, uh, after this, is actually do an activity with you. And um, I think what I'll do is we're going to break it into groups. And... I just got to paste this to, for you. Um, so groups one, let's see, how many people do we have? Um, do, it in, do it in 
four groups. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing here. And we're going to do it in four groups. So we're going to put you in groups and and then we're going to have you do an activity together uh, in um, online with a link, right? Yeah. So I just have to retype this thing here. Yep, three and then four. Three and four. So these are the instructions. And depending on which group you get in, uh, there'll be four groups. Depending on which group you get in, you'll click on the link that I the, the link that's for that group. And we'll we'll tell you when to move to the next when to click next. So you'll spend some time talking about it, doing it, and then we'll tell you when to click next in your groups. The whole thing will take about 10, 15 minutes, and then you'll come back and report. And I think you'll get a good sense of what we, how these, how these uh, patterns of systems thinking work, okay? All right, so now I gotta put you in groups, which is... Hey, uh, I have a question. This is Deidre. Yeah. When we slide to breakout groups, we won't have access to the chat here. Is there a way to make sure that those links show up? Yes, I will send it. To, uh, I will send it to all the groups. Okay, thank you. Where is it? Together as a large group. So what? I, so I'm going to share my my screen here, and. Do it here. Share. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. And the first activity we're going to do is this one. So I'm just going to read the instructions and I'm not going to tell you anything else. You guys, it's your job to discuss it. But uh, the instructions are describe what you see in the image below and record your responses and, and share them. So in the case of this, we'll, we'll just We'll just share them by talking. Or you can throw them in chat. So describe what you see below. Well, fish in an aquarium. Mm -hmm. The plants don't, oh, do we out loud or in chat? Yeah, no, chat or out loud or both. Anybody at any time. I see cichlids. Fish tank. Yep. Yep. Agree. Ecosystem and fish. Water. Someone's pets, maybe. Oh, well, we're seeing an image of all of these things. What I see is a uh, morena that is going to eat the violet fish. <laughs> okay. This Good. is what I, I did not see at, at the first because the, 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 the web page, the, the screen was not shared. But then when you scroll down, I first uh, thought it was a shark, but I think it's a marina and it's going to, it's open his mouth, it's going to take the violet fish, I think. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go to the next uh, step, step. And the instructions here are read the following review of distinction identity other rule. So just the first rule, take your time to read and understand the principles outlined. So you can apply them to the next question. So just read, read this, uh, these four things here. So distinctions are all around us. It's how we name, identify, and differentiate things, ideas, or objects from one another. The identity other structure of distinctions means that any object or idea is both an identity and an other. Example, us versus them. You could flip those around. The distinctions you make can be general and or specific, a cup versus a red porcelain cup. And often a single distinction can become many, many more distinctions when one looks closer at its meaning. For example, birds can be further distinguished to be owls, eagles, seagulls. 
Everybody understand those? Okay, based on that, describe what you see in the image below when applying the distinction rule you just learned. So there are orange fish and yellow fish and some kind of white fish, multicolored fish. Yep. Um, all the different colored plants. The pebbles at the bottom versus the coral rocks on top and the broken pottery. Yeah, I'm, I'm just typing everything you guys say into the text so we can see it. Water molecules. Sorry, say that again. Water molecules. Water molecules. All uh, small fish as opposed to larger fish. Maybe the natural biological elements versus the manufactured ones like the filter and the glass on the aquarium maybe. Yep. Maybe what's inside versus what's outside, even though the outside isn't really in the image, but perhaps there's that distinction. Yep. Actually, what I can see is photons. Photons. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. OK, we're going to go to the next activity. And this time, we're going to describe what you see in the image below, which we already did the first time. But this would be for a separate group. But this time, we're going to uh, just do it from the systems rule. So systems are all around us. It's how ideas or objects are organized, grouped, or nested within one another. The part-whole structure of systems means that any object or idea is both a part and a whole simultaneously. That is, a planet is comprised of land and water parts and is also part of a larger solar system. Uh, so a planet's both a whole and a part. In any whole system, you want to identify the relevant parts to better understand that system. And the systems rule tells us that we can zoom in to see more parts or zoom out to see more holes, zoom in to see the land or, and water parts of the planet, zoom out to see the planet as part of a solar system. So based on that, this time we're not going to use the distinction rule, we're going to use the systems part whole rule. And I want to see what you, what you see in this picture. Well, one way to look at it is the fish are a biological system that takes in certain chemicals and gives out others, but the gravel is actually where the waste products from the fish are processed. So that's kind of a subsystem. And then the circula circulation system that pumps the water through is in the back comes out through a black hose and that circulates and aerates the water. So there's kind of three subsystems. And a water containment system to hold it all together. Nice. Maybe Next like a, a single fish versus like a school of fish. Excellent. Somebody put some food in there from time to time. Yeah. Um, I think zoom out to see what room this is in and maybe zoom out more to see about the house and the neighborhood and the city and so on and so forth. <laughs> nice. Also Don't got the uh, power light, system. Natural light. Yeah. Um, each distinct part of the system interacts with and is dependent on other parts of that system. Okay, good. An, an entertainment system, because um, it's been designed to look nice and to be viewed. Nice. Good, so we're actually seeing that some of the distinctions that we made originally, some of the identities are actually whole part, whole systems that are quite complex. Um, okay, so we're gonna go to the next uh, little, little 
quiz or test or whatever. And again, we, we described the basics. And this time we're going to just use the R rule. So the relationship rule reminds us to identify and examine the relationships among all of the parts. In any system, you want to see not only the nodes or the parts, but also the relevant relationship among them to better understand that system. The action-reaction structure of relationships means that any object or idea is an action or a reaction. It can have an action or a reaction to other objects and ideas. So person A can act upon person B or, it, or react to person B. The R rule encourages not only to, rec to recognize that a relationship exists, but also to distinguish that relationship, to better understand it. In other words, to name it, for example, the relationship between mom and dad might be marriage, not just that they're related, but we name it. And the R rule also encourages us not only to distinguish the relationships, but to see some of those relationships as whole, possibly very complex systems in and of themselves. So that the relationship isn't just a relationship, it's also a distinction and it's also a system. And we call those RDSs, relationship distinction systems. And the reason that's so important is because nature and systems often hide a lot of their secrets inside of relationships. So with understanding that rule, we're gonna ask the same question. Now, what do you see? There might be a feeling um, relationship where one in one organism feeds of the leftovers of the other. Yeah, nice. Um, I think about the, re the relationship between the, I guess the relationship between the fish to the water or the water to the fish. Yes, the water to the fish. Um, and how the water provides oxygen yeah maybe i got my basic science wrong no that's great <laughs> but there's also the proverbial joke that to the fish there is no water they don't make that <laughs> distinction you're getting to perspective Absolutely, there, you're right, right. <laughs> you're seeing it from the fish's perspective until you pull it out of the water yeah <laughs> that's and identity it, other right that's that that contrasting experiences of water versus not water that can be quite uh, quite shocking for the fish. There's uh, the relationship of gravity or more of a force really that's holding everything in place there because it would all flow out over the size of the container if there wasn't. Yep. There's the relationship between the fish and the structures within the tank. You know, it gives them a sense of security and, and who knows what else. Nice. Well, and they might see that one with the red tipped fin as a threat sometimes. Yep. Uh, I think about the relationship to the water filter between the water filter and the water and the fish. <laughs> yep. Okay, great. You guys saw a lot of different relationships that, that are becoming clear. And now we're going to go to the last uh, pattern of, of thinking, of systems thinking, and that is perspective. And perspective rule reminds us to examine systems from multiple perspectives to better understand a system. The point view structure of perspectives means that any object or idea can either be the point of a perspective or it could be the view of a perspective. In other words, a person could, can see another person so one person is the point, one person's the view. Or different states could be a point and see parts of marriage differently in terms of the law. That's the view. Um, and also perspective rule encourages us to take both perspectives with eyes, like stakeholders, people, groups, countries, animals, but also non-human perspectives like economic, political, historical, structural, you know, strengths, weaknesses, color, etc. When you change the way you look at things, which is perspective, the things you look at actually change. So maybe the distinctions will change, the way that the part whole organizes 
changes or the relationships you see change. So the Southern perspective on the Civil War includes different things than the Northern perspective does. They actually see the Civil War very differently. And finally, perspectives can be used as a frame on the system that can either limit or narrow or expand or widen what you see. In other words, looking only at a system from an economic impact perspective will limit what's included while taking a holistic perspective might broaden what you include. So with those, we're gonna look at that same image and ask ourselves from ironically the perspective of perspective. Now, what do you see? The smaller fish might see some of the decoration as a hideout for protection, while the bigger fish might see it more as inter interesting and entertaining to swim in and out of it. Yeah. I see a pet shop industry supplying a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You might see a perspective of somebody who doesn't uh, think that humans should own fish. <laughs> Great. These fish are dependent uh, from uh, external agents. They, they cannot uh, sustain them, themselves uh, indef indefinitely because they are in an aquarium. Yep. Yeah, fantastic. There's a perspective of those who have to feed and maintain the fish in the fish tank versus those who just look at it for entertainment. Yep. Some people might become experts in their fish and their hobby. Yes, exactly. Good. Okay, so I think you have the idea. What I want to... Um, what I want to hit on for a second is this is a very simple activity and you were asked to do relatively simple things about a simple picture. But what I want you to sort of think back on and contemplate is how was that first experience where you just were asked, hey, describe what you see, different from the experiences where you were asked to use distinctions, use systems, use relationships and or use perspectives. What what would you say was the fundamental, you know, what was different about those two scenarios? I think we're consciously taking control of what we pay attention to. In yeah. The yeah, that's a great point. That's actually called metacognition, which is shown to have really positive effects. And that is that you're more aware of what you're looking at or what you're, how you're looking at things. And, and so you're taking control of that. That's great. What else? Um, for me, it was, a, um, I guess, about uh, adapting my mental model. Yes. Um, I think the first was just me assuming that I'm experiencing the reality of this fish tank the way it is. And then as you go through adapting my mental model to see what was actually there. Excellent. Everything yeah. that was actually there. What do you think was different about your actual answers? Do you think your answers were more detailed, more technical before or after? I think it painted a richer tapestry of the picture because you're constantly trying on the different hats or lenses. And so the same pixels on a screen of a single image instance in time was then populated with all these other stories of things that are happening and going around it. And so kind of like that org chart, you're not just looking at a static org chart, you're looking at all the different actions, reactions, uh, distinct, like, yeah, just it, it, it paints a more textured picture, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like, you know, the first, the first time you were asked, hey, what do you see? It's like, I see gravel. But then when you're asked relationships, you go, oh, the gravel is actually a filter for the, for the waste of the fish. And it's, it's actually part of the filtering process. And, you know, all of a sudden you, you see more and you start to, or, or the water has oxygen in it, or, you know, really it's just an image, or there's a, there's a whole pet industry that is, you know, behind this thing, and people are, have jobs 
making fake broken vases, you know, and painting them, right? Like somebody, somebody's a product manager for that product line, right? That's their whole world is little fake things that go in fish tanks, right? That person's perspective is like, I bet they make tons of distinctions you and I don't make about those products. So your distinctions, your systems, your relationships, your perspectives just got way more technical from, from the one starting point till the end. And that's kind of the beginning of the practice of systems thinking and, and everything else is just practice. And I will tell you this, that while these seem like very simple rules, the most advanced systems thinking in the world is using these same rules. When we're doing advanced research, when we're doing you know, when doctoral students are working on really, really advanced things, these are the patterns, these same patterns are being used. So you can use them, you can get started using them today, but the same patterns can get you to the most complex places that you ever wanted to get to. Um, so with that, I, I want to wrap up and then I can take questions for anyone that, um, that's interested in, in sticking on, but I want to be sensitive to time um, and, and if you have to go. Uh, I will tell you, there's our books. Our books are very easy and accessible. And so if you want more on this, I would also encourage you to watch the 12 minute documentary that we sent you uh, on YouTube. That, that one people really say helps them a lot. Read our blog, join ST uh, Systems Thinking daily if you haven't. That's a great way of like just having systems thinking in your life on a daily basis with little tiny like hors d'oeuvre bites of systems thinking. Um, obviously reading our books would be a good step or online courses or email us and ask us questions. We're always uh, happy to, to respond. And there's my email there and Laura's is LAC19. Um, but with that, we, uh, we will kind of wrap it up, but, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions too. So Derek, this is Deidre, and I was introduced to systems thinking this summer. I did the one course that y'all have, it's the, the white belt, and I'm planning to go through, but as a single individual who is still learning, and while in my role at work, like, there are obvious ways that I can be thinking about this, um, but my ability to bring my other teammates in um, to where I can like actually make this a part of my day and something that I can be growing and learning and regularly is really limited. So I'm curious to hear like, aside from yes, take the courses and yes, read the books and yes, join the Facebook group. Like what are, do you have suggestions about other practical ways people can really start to pick this up and own their growth and development? Yeah, so th th that's a great question. It's one that lots of people have. Um, one of the things you can do is exactly what you did. You weren't on the very front of the call, but I, I described that the reason this happened was because of you and your question that you asked, which is, hey, are there any learning partners out there? Getting some learning partners um, is a great way to do it because that, that kind of gets people going. If they're in your, if they're in your group, work group, like you work with them, Sometimes that can be harder to convince people, you know, people are busy and all that kind of stuff. What I typically do and what we found works is you don't try to do all four patterns at the same time. Maybe just start with part whole and just get your colleagues doing part whole and get them to see the value of how they think differently about your work projects just by doing part whole. Then maybe, then maybe give them perspectives. That tends to be one that people like. So part whole and perspectives first, get them seeing, oh, we could take different perspectives on this. And pretty soon they'll start, they'll start going, oh, this, now I see how part whole relates to perspective and then get them doing relationships, then get them doing distinctions. People have the hardest time with distinctions because it's a little more technical, but, you know, just start very small and start with very basic things. But I will tell you that we don't teach our grad students more than what I just taught you. What I'm saying is these four things, if you learn them and you practice them, they can, they, they can tackle any level of complexity. 
So it's, it's almost like uh, you just need that muscle memory. You just need to practice it. A lot of times I'll say practice it on the, well, it's COVID. So you probably aren't going in the car to work, but when on the car to work, when you see a sign or in the shower, like notice the distinctions, notice you, you take a shower every day and just start noticing all the things that you never noticed before and making connections and, you know, breaking it down. Look at the shampoo bottle from the perspective of the of people whose whole job it is to sell you shampoo. And boy, that's a, that's a perspective that that shampoo bottle suddenly takes on a whole new set of meanings, right? Imagine if it was your whole job and you were product manager for shampoo, all the complexities that, 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 that go into that, you know, or the shampoo itself, my God. I mean, that's a chemical equation, right? So very, very complex inside. We just think of it as like, oh, I, I squirt some in my hand and I put it in my hair, right? But to, to a chemist, that thing is a chemical equation. So I would just start small and start with the patterns that I just gave you. And I think your idea of getting a learning partner uh, is, is a great one. And then try to have daily reminders. That's why we started Systems Thinking Daily was to give people daily reminders of it. There's also a component to um, when you go into your organization, that is a system unto itself. Yes. And depending where you reside in that system, you're going to have a perspective. You'll understand relationships between different parts of that system. Um, you'll be able to make distinctions between how people think, how people act, how they operate. So what I love about um, what you brought to the table here today um, is that it dovetails very nicely with some kind of leading design techniques. If you look at the teachings of Ono or John Seddon or Deming from the outside in, that yep. perspective of, of how do we integrate across the system is very important. I love how this would also integrate very well with the Kneffen model. Yep. So um, how do you problem solve and how do you solve wicked problems in all of those four different domains? This also lends itself to that as well. Um, so there are other disciplines, I think, that can um, reinforce some of the learnings that you're, that you're pushing here that are, that are very good. That's right. Um, that gives you a better understanding of the, the applicability of this. Absolutely. We're not seeing this. When you mentioned COVID at the beginning, we're not seeing this anywhere in our response on this planet to COVID. No. <laughs> I, I mean, that's the part that, you know, people say, oh, these things are so simple. Yeah. But if they were so simple, why, why are we not doing it in the face of the worst pandemic that humans have ever faced? Yeah. Why are we not doing any of it? <laughs> we really need to learn to do it. Uh, one question I have, um, you know, I see you've got uh, literature out there yourself, but what are some of the other uh, great literature for systems thinking that you recommend? Um, you, you mean books or you mean like, like uh, academic yeah. papers? Uh, authors or books or, you know, who are some of the, uh, the other great minds um, over time? Uh, when it comes to this type, this line of thinking? I, you know, my, I'm probably biased a little bit, but my postdoctoral training was at the Santa Fe Institute. I think the Santa Fe Institute is doing amazing things in under the guise of what's called complexity science and complex adaptive systems. Um, there's some amazing stuff by Murray Gelman, who unfortunately just recently passed, but he wrote a great book called The Quark and the Jaguar. Um, Anything that comes out of the Santa Fe Institute or people that are affiliated with the Santa Fe Institute, I think is a great, a great start. Um, just because I, they're on the cutting edge of, of understanding complexity and things like that. Did that answer your question or did you want more? I, I mean, that was, that was good. I, I uh, follow Santa Fe um, on uh, LinkedIn, and um, the, I haven't looked in it much other than that, and so that will be good. Um, I'm always looking for uh, books to read, um, and so if there was specific books that you like, uh, yeah, that would it's be funny that the the things that that I think 
yeah, I was at a business conference once. I was up on stage and they, they asked me a similar question, a bunch of entrepreneurs and MBAs. And they said, what book would you recommend for us, you know, uh, to read if, if there was only one book that you'd have us read? And I think they thought I was going to say, you know, like Good to Great or, you know, Jack Welch's Seven Habits or whatever. And I said, you know, I think you should read Darwin's Evolution, you know, The Origin of Species, because, you know, when you understand these fundamental processes like evolution and you understand how deeply fundamental they are, um, that, that applies to so many different things, you know? So I, I guess I would say I would, I would read about complexity. I would read about evolution. Um, I would read about, you know, chaos theory. I think studying the, strangely enough, I think studying the weather is an amazing thing to study because the weather is so relative. Everything is relative in weather systems. And that's really how the world actually works, right? So when you have a, when you have a high pressure, you also have some subsequent low pressure somewhere else and vice versa. And um, everything's interacting and everything's kind of a, a, a blurry, everything's blurry on the edges. And, uh, you know, so I, I don't know if I would say there's a book, but there's definitely concepts or theories that you should understand. And I would start with things like complexity theory, evolution, uh, network theory is another great one. Uh, I would definitely understand network theory, very, very important. Uh, combinatorics in mathematics, permutations in mathematics, all those kinds of things are, uh, really, really important to understand as you try to better understand these, these ideas that, that we're talking about. Part whole, for example, seems like a very simple concept, right? Part whole systems, part whole organization, but part whole is responsible for hierarchies, statistics, all kinds of other very, very complex things. So combinatorics, permutations, all that kind of stuff. So, um, seems like a simple idea, but there's a lot more to it as you get into it. And I find oftentimes it's looking into and research into the natural sciences um, can inform us on how we, yes. we operate in, our, in our, our organizational constructs when we go back to work. 100%. Blocking behavior, um, being able to understand that, but understanding that you can't predict that. Yes. Um, entropy, you know, moving from order to disorder that that is a universal law, but if that's not brought into an organizational setting, we think we've done something, we let it go, and we get upset then when it starts to move right. towards that. Um, inertia, when you think about the, the laws of inertia and having to, how that affects organizational change and getting people to change. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And every once in a yeah. while you find somebody like you who will distill something down in a particular way, in a particular area, that can combine with Snowden and Taichi Ono and Deming, combined with um, laws of thermodynamics. Yeah. Now you start to get a picture of things. Exactly. That seems to make sense and helps you interpret the world and analyze yourself. Yeah, like a, a good book on ecology, all of what, all yeah. of what you just said, Michael, but a, a good book on ecology would be a great, sure. uh, great understanding of things, just e ecosystems. Um, and, and, you know, our book flock, not clock is all about organizational systems. And it's all from this, exactly what Michael's saying. It's from better understanding how flocks and, and schools of fish and these kinds of complex adaptive systems work, uh, because our organizations, every organization is a complex adaptive system, whether you like it or not. So if you don't mm -hmm. treat your organization like a complex adaptive system, what's called a CAS, then, you know, it's going to be baffling to you, frankly. If you treat your organization like a, like a stopwatch or a clock, it doesn't operate like a stopwatch or a clock. It's nothing like a stopwatch or a clock. It's much more like an organic uh, flocking system. It's, it's interesting when I, <clears throat> when I'm listening, when I saw your I discovered you, I think, on a Kneffen event. Oh, okay. And, and then when I dug a little deeper into what you were talking about, it reminded me of uh, The Big Short, the book by Michael Lewis, oh. when he, 
uh, and it talked about some of the guys, particularly anyone that was taking a contrarian perspective, and it, and they were they were going to short the um, the bond market, but that required them to endure incremental losses every day, small uh, losses every day, right. with the notion that sometime in the unpredicted future, like we don't know when, but there will be a payoff. Right. And made a cognition for the for the gentleman that was running that fund was he had to shut off all forms of media that were influencing him um, in ways that were making him irrational to understand and filter out the noise. Yes. <clears throat> and when I read that, that's exactly what, you know, what you talk about here, being able to distinguish the noise from, you know, the value. Yes. Uh, required a knowledge of self and understanding of what was influencing you and how you thought. Absolutely. That's that kind of identity other concept. Yeah. And, and like you said, sometimes, sometimes we get it right, noise and, and, uh, and not, but you know, the background radiation of the universe, the pictures that we have of the universe today, we wouldn't have those if some guy didn't question noise and, and think, what if that noise that I'm seeing is actually signal? And it turns out it was, right? He thought it was actually uh, batshit, actually guano in the, in the satellite. He went and cleaned out the sound, you know, the, the uh, system had no guano in it. He went back and it was still there. And he said, what is this? And it turns out it's background radiation, right? We wouldn't have that picture if we didn't reconcile that distinction. So. Cool. Any other questions? Well, Derek, I really appreciate this. This was uh, very uh, intriguing and uh, informative. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you. I hope, I, you know, just keep pursuing it and keep practicing and you'll get good at it. That's the, that's the key. Practice. It's just like anything, batting, jumping, running. If you practice, you'll get good at it. But I think some of the problem for newcomers is when they come to systems thinking, they get kind of overwhelmed by there's a lot coming at you. And so I think, you know, what do you need to practice? You need to practice distinction making, hard whole organizing, action, reaction, relationships, point view perspectives. Practice those things. They'll start to combine. They'll start to get more and more robust and complex in your practice. And you'll start to see, oh, wow, I can use this in a lot of pretty amazing ways. Um, and, and I, you know, I feel for newcomers because when, you, when you're new to it, it just feels, feels like there's a lot of stuff. Um, so. I sent I sent a link to, um, of one of your one of your videos. I'm not sure which. It might have been your TED talk when you talked about the education system and how we were yeah. educating. I sent it to my grade three teacher. Now you have to understand, I'm 60, so my grade three teacher <laughs> is 80. She she complete she totally appreciated that. We oh. had a discussion about. Um, uh, some of the conflicts she had around educating a young child back in the 60s and 70s and trying to reconcile the differences that when when you consider the entirety of the the curriculum and the interrelatedness of that right and um so your your message completely resonated with her oh that's great yeah these are these are not new ideas these are old ideas that you know as a theorist i brought together but i mean our, your brain is doing these things all the time, whether you like it or not. So uh, it just helps to know that you're doing it so that you can do it better. Um, Derek, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I'm so appreciative and um, I'm going to check out so I can give these little people I have some lunch. Um, okay. But thank you. Yeah, thank you, Deidre, for, for taking the initiative. I love, I love your it was just such a simple post, but I was like, wow, that's a great idea. We should hit on that. So I'd lo we'd love to do this more often. If, if, if it's something people would enjoy, we're happy to do it. Uh, but I want it to come from people that ask for what they need. So uh, I'll do whatever, whatever I can do to help. Yes, thank you very much. I, I, hey, I thoroughly enjoyed you. that, Derek. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, everyone. Any other questions? I'm, I'm happy to answer others if, if you want to stick around. Could, 
could there be a future session where you use the Platica tool in order to see you map it out in real time? Yes. Yeah, we could do that. And I can also show how to draw it with pen and paper and, and the techniques that I use to both draw it like, you know, pen and paper and then how I use Plectica. And um, like for those of you that don't know, Plectica is a software we developed that that uh, makes it so you can just kind of visually map out systems and DSRP um, and in and make maps of anything you want. Um, so if you go to Plectica.com, you can get, I think, a free account. I'm, I'm not involved anymore. I just helped invent it. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that's something Deidre actually brought up and I'd be happy to do a session on that if you'd like. Thank you very much. Yeah. Anything else? I don't want to. I don't want to press end until I know that nobody wants to ask a question. So I'll wait until you all disappear. And if you want to ask a question, I'll wait around. I think. I think I'm good. I really appreciate the time. I uh, I studied human complex systems under um, Dario Nardi at UCLA. I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, right. and um, so I've been slowly kind of following systems thinking since that introduction in undergrad. And so I've been following the Cabrera lab for a while and saw the DSRP uh, methodology. And this is my first time like sitting through and like a live kind of presentation by you. So this is great to just kind of pull everything together and continue like you're saying the practice of just, okay, yeah, let's kind of relearn, let's repractice. Um, and uh, yeah, this is great. So thank, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Evan. All right, I'll see you around another one perhaps. Okay, take care. Cheers. Okay. Is it just you and me left? <laughs> yes, uh, and Annika. Okay. Uh, so I'm sorry being late here. Um, snowy weather in Sweden, so. No problem. What can you say? So next time, Derek, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So what kind of topics that, you know, came up today for the next kind of uh, event? Through? I think that, you know, the, the thing that I've been asked a few times is to do kind of a mapping, systems <laughs> mapping, like how to draw it by hand or how to use software of various kinds. Right. And so maybe maybe the next one we could offer is is how to just, you know, how to draw stuff, how to draw systems. Like logical thinking and loops yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and cool. perspective. How do you how do you draw perspective and how do you what are the different ways you can do part whole and how can you do what we call RDSs, relationship distinction systems, where you turn a relationship into a system, that type of thing. You know, there's some little quick techniques that um, whether you're drawing or whether you're using software that we've learned over the years that just make it a little bit more uh, easy to do. So maybe, yeah. maybe we'll do that. Okay, cool. So, nah, sorry I missed it. Um, I looked forward to it, but I, I couldn't, yeah. That's okay. You know, we, vi we recorded it, so we're gonna post it and you'll be able to watch the recording maybe. Ah, awesome. So going out um, through mail later on? Uh, we'll send it to mail if you registered yep. uh, for this. You'll get it. And we'll also probably put it up on Systems Thinking Daily or something like that. Okay, cool.